Well, hello everyone. Welcome to the CX Green Room, where the heavy hitters in customer experience join us to share their insight and expertise. I'm Ginger Conlon, Thought Leadership Director at Genesis, and joining me today is Dr. Nicola Millard, Principal Innovation Partner at BT. Welcome. Thank you very much. Good to be here. So glad you're here with us today. So we're here to talk about what consumers and employees are uh, are saying about how organizations can deliver remarkable experiences. And as we all know, customer and employee expectations are continually changing, but there's an additional challenge to meeting those expectations, which is consumers are bringing their expectations to work and employees are bringing their expectations to their consumer interactions. And so each is influencing the other. And, you know, so for example, you know, in consumer realm, they're bringing their, their expectations. Um, and uh, well, let's take that back in the employee realm, they're taking their ex their consumer expectations for relevance, for personalization, for support to the workplace. So this is all really challenging, but that it doesn't stop there, but wait, there's more as well, as they say in marketing, um, generational differences are also playing a role. And so Genesis recently published the report, Generational Dynamics in the Ex and the Experience Economy, uh, that uncovers some of those variances. And so Nicola, we'd love to get your viewpoint on some of the findings as well as your advice on how to address these shifts to build those remarkable loyalty building experiences. But first, tell us about yourself and your role at BT. <laughs> well, I used to have the uh, the in interesting title of futurologist, which um, I always had a slight love hate relationship with because uh, it always comes with the same question, which is, um, do you have a crystal ball? And I keep saying, yes, I do. Someone very kindly gave me one, but I saw no future in it. So, uh, so sadly, I'm slightly more boringly known as a principal innovation partner now. But um, so I'm part of BT's innovation team. Um, my role and my team's role is to innovate with and for largely our business and corporate customers um, and I've been based for most of my career actually uh, and in our main research and innovation uh, area um, I'm actually based in Ipswich in the UK um, about seven miles from where I'm standing at the moment is our main research and innovation center called Ad Astral Park and I always say that's one reason why I don't need a crystal ball to be honest because um, I can literally walk down a corridor there and bump into somebody who is a world's expert in AI or quantum key cryptography which frankly I have Apps. You need a degree in PhD in physics to understand uh, quantum key cryptography because it's all a bit quantum, baby. But um, but uh, so I, I work with with those guys with academic partners. Um, I don't do my job on my own. Basically, it's not about looking at tea leaves and crystal balls. But I'm my background's a bit weird from in an innovation perspective because um, I'm half a technologist. I'm not sure if it's the half you can see or the half you can't, but um, the rest of me is a psychologist. Um, so I always say I look at the most disruptive part of innovation, which is, of course, us, uh, not the technology, because unless we embrace it and use it, it's well. It, it's useless, frankly, but uh, right. so I, I do a lot around both of the areas you've just spoken around. So uh, so customer experience and employee experience. But I must admit, the 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 thing that's often closest to my heart, uh, which I love geeking out about, is, is uh, the contact center, because it's almost the perfect fusion of all of the areas I'm interested in. So you've got customers wanting a great customer experience um, coming in often, you know, with technology mediating them uh, and then often having to to get through to a, a human being an employee an agent who is also often interacting with technologies as well um and you know creating an experience so it's kind of the perfect fusion of all the things i'm really really interested in in terms of how technology uh you know affects things like customer experience but also bearing in mind that employees have to deliver the customer experience so those two areas are really really heavily intersected Absolutely. There's so much um, overlap in even in the technologies that that both sides are using. Yeah. So interesting. Um, so going back to the generational dynamics report, let's start with some of the findings from the customer side of the equation. So we found that consumers rank quality and price as top criteria when they when they're considering purchasing from a brand, which which makes sense. Right. Um, and then when we dive deeper we find that 65% of consumer consumers overall 
and 74% of millennials rank a brand's reputation for customer service as one of the most important factors. And then where there's a more noticeable, noticeable split is between those younger and older generations. So Gen Z and millennials place far more credence on recommendations, influencers, and ads than Gen X and boomers do. So considering all the research that BT has that you were mentioning and your view of the market, what's your take on all of this? So, I mean, we've been doing research for a very long time on uh, on the customer experience and particularly looking at global customers and sort of asking them, we call it a temperature check of, uh, of how people are feeling about the customer experience. So we've got over 10 years worth of data um, on it, which is fascinating itself because we can start to see this sort of evolution of what people are expecting. And broadly, I mean, what you've just said, uh, we're finding too. Um, so, you know, people value customer experience heavily, um, but it's almost... Um, expected now a, a good customer experience is not the wow that it used to be um it's not the differentiator that it used to be it's kind of a hygiene factor you have to have good service in order to survive to be perfectly honest so that customer experience piece um i mean obviously ranks very highly in everyone's minds uh, whether they're young or old um so it is it is incredibly important to get it right i mean other things we're finding um i think Underlying that is, I always say from a behavioral perspective, um, it's quite interesting because fundamentally as human beings, we're quite lazy. Um, so we, we do get a very big theme coming through around make it easy for me. Um, mm -hmm. And that's almost one of the driving behavioral factors that we see, particularly in the omni-channel mix, because people tend to go to channels that they find easy. Um, and then I always say it's got to be a sort of balance on easy because it needs to be both easy for the customer, but also easy for the organization. Um, if it's not, if it's tipped the wrong way either way, you've got a bit of a problem. I, either customers are probably not going to do it or employees are not going to do it. So particularly in the innovation space, which is where I work, um, a lot of the fundamental questions I ask are, you know, who does this make it, 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 does this make it easier? Who does it make it easy for? And if the answer is it doesn't, You've got a real job getting that innovation accepted. And then I, you mentioned generation uh, differences. Certainly, we do see some between the sort of two extreme ends. But I would say, actually, there's probably more commonality than differences in that middle bit. I think when you look at omni-channel experiences, I think younger customers use more channels. Um, so uh, And you can put loads of channels in as well, of course. Uh, so as many channels as you want. But the compromise there is, does that make your, your job easier as an organization or does it does it make it really really complicated so again you've got to look at what 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 are the channels that customers are valuing and, and finding easy but also what are the customers that you value and find easy and bring that together and obviously as you you, you look at the sort of ex, uh, other extreme the older customer you do tend to see the phone dominating but i will say mm -hmm. There is a proviso on that. That's when you're calm and everything's going well. Um, we have this thing that we've looked at breaking down your customer goal and their emotional state. Uh, mm -hmm. And we've broken it down into positive, negative and neutral. Um, and particularly when you're in a negative state, uh, we call it customer in crisis. Actually, younger customers tend to behave very similarly to older ones. So the phone becomes quite important to get right when you're in crisis. And there are lots of reasons for that, even the brain's a bit weird when we go into crisis because we're not rational. There are lots of chemicals that change even things like our short term memory capacity. So designing complex IVRs or, you know, complex menu structures or even, you know, complex FAQs is not going to work with a customer that's in crisis. Hence, often people do maybe try digital first, but often switch to the phone. And we do find that that predominates across all, all age groups as well. So there are differences in ages. But actually, if you go into crisis mode, there are there's less difference. Uh, the phone tends to dominate. And of course, that has a knock on effect to your agents as well, because your agents, when people pick the phone up, are typically dealing with very complex and very emotive stuff. Um, and yeah. sometimes the technology has made that even worse if it's badly Im implemented um, or you get stuck in a loop or, you know, we've all been there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's interesting that you say that um, for on the agent side, because um, one of the things when, as you start implementing AI for say auto summarizations, um, Yes, agents have to take the time to review those summarizations. 
So they get that, that short break between calls, but it's shorter than you when when you use that, the break winds up being shorter. And if their agents are taking one stressful call after the next, like you know, just kind of kind of a little bit of a tangent, like the, you know, the managers and supervisors need to really think about what am I what am I doing instead to to give our agents that break so they can reset for the next person, you know? Oh, yeah. um, but going back to the channels, actually our findings in the, in the report align so much with what you're saying, because, you know, brands need to consider that optimal channel mix that you were talking about, right? Works for them, works for um, the customer and also is, is, you know, connected as much as it can be, right? Because you don't want to, put customers into dead ends that you were like, you were talking about that are frustrated and then they have to repeat themselves. But the thing is, um, as you also pointed out, it's what's, what's important today, but well, also what's important five years from now, because everyone's consumers across generations, like you said, they still prefer the, to talk to a, a person, whether that's on the phone, email, web chat. But when you look closer at the demographic cohorts, that's where you start to see the differences where millennials and Gen Z prefer digital channels and especially social media and asynchronous channels far more than um, you know boomers and Gen X do. So, you know, as the number of people in 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 the consumer market shifts you know, over over the next X number of years, like you need to start considering how is your ch channel mix going to need to change over time oh, yeah. as well so yeah that, should, that's, i mean that's something we've looked at um yeah. sorry <laughs> but yeah leaping in there but um <laughs> something we've looked at with the data that we've got because it's across a number of years um one of the most fascinating thing is to just plot channel choices over those years and how they've ebbed and flowed and it's weird because the phone at one point was going down and down and down and then suddenly it went back up again and we were kind of what's going on um so we i mean causality and correlation is obviously quite difficult to do in data um but one of the things we did look at was the rise of digital channels like web chat for example almost coincided with the, the the phone channel going up and what we were seeing then and this was sort of 2015 2017 time um was that probably web chat. So obviously that's synchronous. That's when your little button pops up and goes, can we help? And you go, yes, please, please help me. Um, the problem there was the economics of that often was around, you know, concurrency. So agents on multiple sessions. And we know that sometimes that can make for a very fragmented conversation. Sometimes it just drops out. Um, so at that point in time, it wasn't necessarily delivering a good customer experience. And what happens when a digital channel fails is people tend to rebound onto traditional mm -hmm. channels like the phone. So suddenly we saw the phone going up and it's still it's still up there. Um, so because it's a very human channel, it's quite a reliable channel. It's a channel that people kind of trust. So, I mean, it, it doesn't mean it's not going to go down again. But I think one of the things that we're finding is that as we drive more digital channels, as and, and as I said, there are many we could drive. We've got to make sure it's a good customer experience. Otherwise, we'll see people sort of bound and rebounding back into traditional channels. The other thing to comment is most customers, particularly when they're in crisis, use multiple channels. And again, um, so they're sitting on maybe three or four at the same time. They might be trying to ring, emailing on on whatever social channel, um, maybe on a chat channel as well. Um, and the, the challenge there is if you answer in different channels and then get give an inconsistent experience, all that do is all that does is confuse customers. So again, that's why it's very important to try and get those omni-channel strategies right and get those customer experiences as good as you can through the channels that your customers want to use and the channels that you find easy. Yeah. Yeah. We, we saw similar um, in our state of customer experience report um, or our connected customer experience report or around the timing of the pandemic, um, you know, obviously bots and other digital channels were just really pervasive at the time. And so usage went up with with bots satisfaction went down with them probably because you know companies were trying to get them out there and they weren't always optimal or or if they if they did work well they maybe 
didn't meet customers' expectations because customers expected more than what was at realistic. And so unless you're super clear, hey, I'm a bot and I can only do these things for you, you know, then you wind up with someone's frustrated and then they wind up calling and et, et cetera. Absolutely. And I, I, I say it sort of, I used to design the IVRs, so press ones and press twos and all of that lovely stuff. And I always apologize for that for a start, but, um, but you know, <laughs> It, it's almost mirrored in the bot scenario because we're getting people stuck in infinite loops. We're not giving them the right options. And obviously we've got natural language IVR as well now, which is much better than pressing ones and twos, frankly, but it's still not perfect. And I think we're, we're seeing that mirrored in the bot world as well. Mm -hmm. um, and particularly bots that are kind of asked me anything. So you're right, you know, they are, the more, the more you, they ask, you, you try and get them to do, the less good they are, frankly, um, they're much, much better at, at deep and narrow. Um, so we're actually seeing proactive bots becoming a lot more successful than maybe the reactive ones. So in other words, if you've you've sent a message reminding somebody about, uh, about an appointment and they want to change it, actually, that's a lovely scenario for a bot to manage. I think it's the ask me anything uh, that can be problematic. And then we overlay the hype on uh, generative AI at the moment, which uh, has raised customers' expectations because they've had a flavor of things like chat GPT and organizations. Some organizations have been brave enough to maybe deploy uh, generative AI. And we've seen some instances where that might not have been the wisest decision because they're really good conversationalists. But as we know, it's the data that they use that makes them valuable. And if they suddenly go off the rails and start hallucinating as uh, as um, no, certainly you know, customers like uh, you know Air Canada and and uh, I think there's been a there was a one of the parcel delivery firms um, it went off the rails and started swearing and denouncing the company. So you know yeah. that's probably not what you want to do. So I keep saying with with that sort of technology, it's it's really powerful, but you might want to try it internally. And that's where your employee experience might come in. Because I actually, if your agents are dealing with so many things these days um, and they we can't train them all the time, is there something that we can sit you know, alongside them that actually helps them navigate potentially you know, 10 databases and, and multiple procedures that they're having to, to deal with? Because actually they their talent is firstly the human brain. It's really good. It does complexity. It does problem solving really well. Um, but you know, talking to customers is their job. Um, so yeah. they need to pay attention to the customer, not necessarily <laughs> all of the back end processes. So my instinct is, well, that kind of technology could be really powerful to support agents in what we what has been emerging over the past ten years. To be honest, as we put more technology into the contact center. It's done things like, you know, call handle times are not going down, they're going up. Um, and some people worry about that. But I keep saying that's your tech working. Your agents are now just getting the really complex stuff. Um, but that's got a knock on effect on potentially how you pay them, what training they're given, uh, their level of, uh, of kind of seniority in a business. It's not an entry level job necessarily anymore. Um, so, yeah. you know, all of those things, I think, has a huge impact on that employee experience as well. Yeah, absolutely. And it's just going to keep shifting as the the AI is able to be even more of a co-pilot. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's an interesting space, I think. It is. And I want to talk more about the employee experience. But before we jump over to that, um, let's just talk a little bit about personalization on the consumer side. It continues to be a hot topic. And, it, you know, the, the cool but creepy, um, you know, D debate has has been going on for such a long time. Um, the report finds that across generations, consumers are looking for personalization. And what's interesting is not just in the in their interactions with agents, where you expect that the agent is going to have access to your information, but also in those self service channels. So they want the companies to take the information that they have about them and and use it in a in a relevant, safe way. Right. So. But this is also no surprise, especially with younger generations. They want that personalization across channels. And of course, they're more likely to give up their personal information for that more personalized experiences. So how can organizations take a more people-centered view to deliver that personalized experience without seeming creepy or intrusive? 
It's a very fine line. I always say there's a fine line between a butler and a stalker in this area because uh, what you want is a butler that knows everything about you but knows when it's appropriate um, to do stuff for you. Uh, a stalker is inappropriate. Um, I mean, partially, I think personalization is part of that easy um, thing I mentioned earlier because to be frank and honest, again, we, we have too many choices often as consumers and, and confronting people with tons and tons of choices as we do in digital arena there's no boundaries in the digital space particularly when you're shopping um you don't want everything um your brain can't well it goes into freeze mode basically um so personalization is great and obviously you know com uh, companies like amazon have been doing it for very well for years because they have too much there's too much choice in there so we want the relevant choices rather than all the choices so i think that's the first thing to say about personalization then, you know, using that to, to potentially become a little bit more proactive. Um, I think, again, that's around appropriateness. So you can kick in machine learning. But I always say, particularly if you're looking at pushing messages out um, to customers, um, uh, you know, it's got to be the right channel. It's got to be the right time. And it's got to be it's got to be the right message. Um, and if it's not, it becomes annoying. Um, and then certainly if you're looking at things like uh, GDPR in Europe, um, mm -hmm. I, I have every right to go as a consumer, you're just annoying me now or you're getting creepy. You're not having my data anymore because you're not giving me value. And I call this a me economy because in some senses I'm bartering some of my data um, to get something back. And if I don't get that something back, why would I give you my data? And of course, machine learning AI does not work by magic. Um, so a lot of the, it's about data. Um, a lot of it's around how do we how do we get that square that me economy uh, to sort of say, okay, it's an advantage for the customer. It makes the customer's life easy, but actually it makes the, the the company's life easy as well. But it's got to be appropriate because, as I said, <laughs> there's a fine line between a butler and a stalker. <laughs> yeah, I, I I love that comparison. I also love the whole me economy, and um, you know and how that translates to personalized experiences. And I feel like that's also, you know, as we go now talk about the, the employee engagement side um, applies because, you know, yes, your people are, are bringing their consumer experiences to work, right? They want higher expectations, they have higher expectations for empathy, for shared values, for personalized work experiences, like, you know, more flexible schedules and more uh, personalized career paths. So I want to talk more about that. But before we dive in, I love this. You did your PhD dissertation on context and our aging experience. Tell us a little bit about why and what you discovered. We get dangerous at this point because anyone talking about their PhD can spend hours boring everybody. <laughs> but um, I, I'll try not to. Um, so, I mean, I've been working in the contact center space for quite a while before doing my PhD. So I actually did my PhD uh, whilst working full time. Um, but the only way to do that um, was to actually use what I was working on. Um, and a lot of it was about um, particularly, well, there were several things. So firstly, we knew it was a stressful job. Um, so what could we do to, um, what motivates an agent? You know, what, how can we how can we make it a job that's a good job? Um, so a lot of that was around, you know, how do they keep control given this high demand? Actually, classic psychology will tell you high demand and low control equals stress so we can kind of see that in the in the business um we can see that through churn figures we can see that through sickness rates all of that you know so a lot of it was about how do we pull the levers to give agents a little bit more control um the other aspect of it was around technology so obviously we could put technology in to help um, but people don't just adopt technology because it's there they adopt technologies because there has to be a reason. So a lot of the the, the really technical stuff um, goes into the psychology of why people accept or reject technologies in the first place. And without going too, into, too much into the theory, because everyone will be asleep, um, it, it boils down to, I call it the three U's. Is it useful to me? Uh, is it usable? And then who else is using it? And this applies as much to consumers and customers as it does to employees. So, you know, the first thing is, yes, probably the technology is useful, but you might need to persuade me. Um, how does it fit into how I do my job? Have you, you know, trained me on it? We often drop things on desktops without actually explaining what they're for. So, you know, um, that, that sort of thing is very important to get right. Usability often is better in the consumer space than it is in the employee space, because quite frankly, 
employees don't have a choice in the technology that they use but that isn't an excuse to make it horribly unusable or require people to do you know a five eight week course on how to use the tech that should not be the case it should be a lot more intuitive and often the problem is for employees it often isn't and then the the used bit who else is using it um is where evil psychology comes in so this is a lot of behavioral economics and that's a, to do with peer adoption who else is adopting it and certainly in the employee space that's around you know are my um, are my team leaders adopting it are they actually do they know what it is are they sort of selling it to me um who else is adopting it in my team are they kind of key influencers so starting to understand the levers on that as well uh, you can start to to um persuade people i guess that this is relevant to them so useful usable use is a mantra i use not just for employees but also for a lot of consumer technology as well but as i said contact centers are almost the perfect cauldron bubbling cauldron of tech customers and employees that you know having a psychological eye into it uh, is just fascinating they're incredible uh, to study and also easy to measure so that's the other thing yeah that the, the measures you can you can start to to look at um you know is this improving um csat is it improving um uh you know uh, employee experience uh, recommendations all sorts of things so you know it's great from an academic perspective. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we did a study while a while back on um, agent values and preferences, and you know, it was interesting. We, there's lots of great findings, but one that stands out to this conversation is that um, one of their favorite things about their job is learning new skills and technologies. And I think that that is a great asset that um, you know supervisors as as technology keeps evolving, you know, right and right now so quickly with with the, all the changes to AI and things like that. You know, the, you've got a team of people who pretty much want to go along for the ride as long as you are, you know, showing like the what's in it for them and how it's going to help them as well, right? So Oh, completely. And I think, you know, interviewing people and saying, well, I I, I did a ton of agent interviews and sort of said what gets you out of bed in the morning. And it's a combination absolutely of, you know, what do I feel as if there's purpose in my job? Am I given flexibility and autonomy? What's my team leader like? Do I like my team? All of those are factors that, that they bring in that actually are probably the indicators if those go wrong, that they're about to leave. Yeah, yeah. Um, so going back to the survey quickly, we found that workers across generations, no surprise, two thirds say they expect their employers to provide flexibility and work-life balance. Um, and then half expect sufficient opportunities for professional growth, which I found to be low, but that's just me. Um, millennials, highest expectations across the board, just like on the consumer side, they just want it all, and that's just how it is. Um, and then Gen Z, relatively low expectations as an employee comparatively, but also not really surprising because they're newer to the workforce. So we give them a little bit of time and they're probably will have higher expectations as well, which goes along with one of our findings, which is looking five years out, Gen Z and millennials expect that flexibility, work-life balance, and personalized career paths will be table stakes. And so, you know, you've talked a little bit about the digital workplace and, and having the, the right technologies. How can organizations start now to meet these future expectations of our younger the younger half of our workforce i mean to, to to again to a certain extent we we tend to see differences on the extremes um in terms of, of preferences in work um i always say actually the ultimate is a, around how do we create good work for everybody um mm -hmm. and flexibility always comes up very very highly and obviously uh, interestingly i mean it was being talked about pre-pandemic the pandemic gave us a flavor of how you know, fully remote work could work. And it's quite interesting. Again, um, some of my research colleagues um, did some fabulous work on, on team leaders um, during lockdowns and agents, actually. But um, uh, most agents actually did 
wants to keep working in a flexible way, not necessarily five days a week at home, um, but in, in what is kind of termed the hybrid model at the moment, say three, two or two, three, or actually we even had different patterns, maybe a week on a week off. Um, a lot of that was being driven by the cost of the commute as well. So that was a factored in from an agent's perspective, but they had a very high desire. I think 71% of them said that they, they wanted that flexibility in their workplace. Team leaders, I think initially we, we did several interviews across um, lockdowns and then back into the normal. I'm not sure it is normal, to be honest, but I think traditional and newer are, are sort of clashing. Team leaders were very anxious initially about moving fully remote. Then they figured out how to do fully remote. But I think they were then worried about hybrid because when you're you're trying to manage a team where, you know, you can see half the people if you are co-located, um, but half are remote, it's very difficult. And particularly for contact center managers who, I mean, some of the best ones are, are very, you know, they watch their team and, and they see tears and they give hugs and they give, um, you know, sympathy uh, if things have gone horribly wrong, because they do sometimes, you know, this is a job where you are exposed to high levels of abuse. The interesting challenge is to do that remote. Um, and I, I, in my PhD, I wrote about this thing around communities of coping. Um, uh, how do you establish a community where you have a buddy, uh, wherever you happen to be, um, that can offer you sympathy? Um, you know, what mechanisms can you have to alert team leaders to to maybe hop on a call if there is uh, a trouble when you, they can't see you? That does require a very open culture and and agents being willing and able to admit when they are struggling. Um, and again, that's that's more of a cultural thing than a technology thing because frankly, we can use technologies to create communities of coping now it's just a case of uh, again creating a culture where agents do feel supported and and generally loved by their team leaders and and managers um wherever they happen to be and actually even things like you know spinning their chair around and yelling across the room you can't do that when you're working from home so again how do you create something knowledge communities as well not just coping but you know if i've been asked a difficult question what's the answer and that's where again i think that ai piece might come in around you know something that just sits alongside the agent again doesn't matter where they're working um it's something that just supports them so i think there's lots of things we can do uh, but i do get the the, the sort of um the general vibe in a lot of the research that we've been doing, not just on the contact centre, that people do value flexibility, often over pay. Um, so you could potentially pay people about 8% less if you give them more flexibility. And that could be everything from flexible work patterns to shift bartering to payback schemes. There are all sorts of creative ways that we can uh, you could use to actually give um, both agents and team leaders a bit more flexibility. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I actually just had a conversation with someone who was who said exactly that um, about themselves. They were like, I would take a pay cut of significance to keep my current schedule. And I was like, all right, wow. <laughs> well, we're we're getting late on time. I just want to quickly ask, we talked a lot about AI and Gen AI, but any thing that you're seeing out there in the market that's making that biggest impact on experience, whether customer experience, employee experience, or you know, where they overlap that uh, customer experience leaders should be paying attention to now, starting to do something really, you know, that's going to make a difference over the next few years that they need to start tackling right now. I mean, the one I'm seeing, and, and to be honest, this has been going on for a while, is the analytics piece um, around AI. So uh, not so much the gen AI, but um more the analytical side of it where, where I mean particularly with things like I have a I have a, a controversially a slight problem with things like um, net promoter score for example I mean it's it's a lovely simple score but what does it actually mean um, and I think a lot of the analytics power is that you can start to not just quantify uh, you can actually do a lot of uh, really powerful analytics on your qualitative data as well um, so often it's the verbatims that are the interesting thing. And often it's the bit you don't look at because it's hard. But I mean, over the years, we've been starting to see increasing sophistication in, in the analytics tools that you can apply across all channels as well uh, to actually gather, you know, 
what is what is this real experience? How can we do better without just saying, hey, look, our net promoter score is going up or down? Um, I always say the, the big question is, OK, why? <laughs> um, that's the bit that we, we need to know a lot more about because the, the figure won't tell us an awful lot. Uh, so I, th I think actually I'm um, in the customer and employee experience space. I think the uh, the more powerful analytics tools that we have, um, the more potentially we can improve both both sides of that experience. A hundred percent. OK. All right. So before we go, we have a question that came in. Let's just hop over to that for a second. So Leslie asks, um, is a context center position more of an agent job or is it a, a video gamer more qualified? Yeah, which is pretty interesting. What, what, what do you think? I mean, I mean, one of the channels could be video, um, of, of course, or, or indeed virtual worlds. Um, I mean, I think the agent job now is is um, it's difficult to define it because uh, agents have to be. I, I've always called them super agents because they almost need superpowers because they need to be empathetic. They need to have all the knowledge in the universe at their fingertips. They need to be able to talk to customers um, across multiple channels as well. So, you know, they've got to be able to talk to them potentially over a, uh, a more traditional phone channel, but they've also got to be very good over the more written channels as well. So, I mean, if you look at that, you, you go, wow, where do I find these people? <laughs> but if you've got a video gamer that have got has got that kind of skill, well, why not? Because potentially they could... Uh, we did actually experiment at one point with putting a, a a contact. Well, it was actually a bank branch in Second Life. I don't know if you remember that, but that was one of the early metaverses. Um, and oddly enough, nobody wanted to bank in Second Life. But, you know, we were looking at, you know, could we have a back end human agent actually front ending an avatar? And we're still looking at that sort of concept when we're, we're looking at. Something quite exciting at the moment for me as a Star Wars fan anyway is volumetric video. So the ability to be beam in hol holograms rather than 2D screens. Um, could that be used for customer service, particularly in emergency situations, say at airports, for example, or um, for crowd control? I, I mean, there's loads of who knows? Who knows? Um, but, you know, that that kind of thing brings an extra added dimension an extra added complexity to who would you who would you use in that situation? And probably the answer is an expert. Um, so it's yeah. the expertise, I think, that's starting to become the most important facet of the of the agent's jobs, the ability to talk to the customer and not necessarily know everything about everything, but being able to you know, take on complex problems, calm people down. All of that's a very specific skill set which is a very hard skill set to recruit for and indeed train for. Um, so, yeah, we, we as an industry, I think if we want to attract really top performers, um, things like the flexibility that we were just talking about is probably more important necessarily than whether you're a video gamer or whether you have specific um, industry skills. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I agree 100 percent. But I also have to say that imagine a 3D avatar helping you put together your ikea furniture that's what we need I mean, i'd buy that <laughs> <laughs> well thank you so much nicola for all of your insights for such an excellent discussion and thank you everyone for joining us here in the cx green room we'd love it if you'd like and share the show i put the um link to the generational dynamics report in the comments if you want to learn more about that and we will see you next time in the CX Green Room.